Hey everybody, how's everybody doing this week? Hope everybody's being safe and being well and surviving all the chaos in the world that's going on right now. So, this week, it's part five, I guess, of um, world building. So we're continuing to talk about world building, and even though we are still kind of continuing this conversation, you know, in the in the vein of world building, um, really, you know, today is um, kind of a standalone topic. Um, today we are going to talk about storytelling, and really it could be storytelling within world building or storytelling within games, you know, in general. And so hopefully this will be a topic that, you know, many game designers or aspiring writers, um, level designers, or anybody that's interested in, you know, kind of making games and making stories will appreciate. But this week also, you know, um, I think is especially good for, for anybody who's an artist um, and, and others who are on a game team who also want to understand um, the significance of what I call story within a game. And what you have to remember is that story is, you know, is in a lot of games, um, kind of everything, right? And it permeates every aspect of the game or, or it can. And I think this is the mistake that a lot of people make is that it's really hard for somebody, um, often the creative director or the project director or somebody who's kind of high up in the project to sort of work with the entirety of the team to really understand what is story and how does story affect the entire project. And I think it's really easy to devolve story into either just kind of the, the core base story, the high over, overview story for a project or to for it to you know be kind of, become kind of encompassed in just the dialogue that characters have and the speaking and the words that we that we read on screen or the words that we hear or the dialogue that is spoken you know through text or, or voiceover or however those are done. But what I want you guys to see today is that that story is everywhere. And and story isn't just you know, a bunch of words and that story is, um, something if you're making a story driven game, um, you know, is, is one of the biggest parts of the game that's really hard to, um, to really incorporate because it's so vast and it's so broad and encompasses really almost every team, you know, and every person on the game team to really make a great story. That's really all encompassing within a, within a project. And so, Keep this in mind as, as we talk about story today and that, that story is really broad. It's really something that, that you know, permeates all aspects of your project. And just to be clear, you know, I do recognize and understand that not all games have stories. You, know, um, you could be making a sports game that has no story. You could be making a puzzle game, you know, things like that. So there, there's lots and lots and lots of games out there that do not have stories, all right? So don't get me wrong when I say all games are, are kind of quantified as everything. Today, and for today's topic, we are talking about story-based games. But that doesn't mean that, that a sports game or something couldn't have a story, just as an aside. I mean, I did a game called TNA Wrestling. And for those of you that are not familiar with professional wrestling, uh, professional wrestling is basically male soap opera. And for all intents and purposes, the stories and the romances and the fights and the, you know, who's um, battling who this week for which girlfriend and everything else that happens within the, the drama of a, of not only just a, a wrestling, professional wrestling TV show, but also that, that shows up in the games is still important and still a big part of the story modes of the games and stuff. So, so don't assume that just because you're doing even a sports game, that your sports game can't have story to deepen uh, a user mode or an experience or things like that. And so, so there can be uses of drama, interactive narrative, interactive fiction um, used in many different ways, you know, throughout many different projects. So before we get started, let's give a couple shout outs and highs to, to my usual um, suspects, Cassie, Jonathan, Penny, welcome everybody. And um, to everybody else who's um, coming or showing up, um, um, thanks for being here and thanks for spending your valuable time with me today. And hopefully I don't ramble too badly. So one of the challenges, you know, with this topic, and we'll see, I honestly don't know how fast I'm going to go today. I'm going to try and kind of go a little slow 
and try to really give deep lessons and, and stuff. I, I did my best to throw together another PowerPoint in my few minutes that I had. Um, I don't know if today's topic is going to be one or two weeks. We'll see how far we get today. Um, and if you guys have questions again, please, you know, please ask. Um, today cannot cover the extent of and totality of writing in games. It, it's too big of a topic. It's something that literally I could teach an entire course on and probably still not even scratch the surface of. So today, you know, is going to be if you are a writer at all, or if you have any knowledge or passion of writing or any anything within writing. Some of this may be a little repetitive for you, um, but I really wanted to approach this for people who knew little to nothing about writing and games and, and and understanding storytelling in games. Again, abstracted out beyond just writing. So this is not going to be necessarily a class on writing, but we are going to talk about um, some key things there. Um, I'm going to give you guys some some other kind of material or things to think about areas to look at and then you know maybe in the weeks to come we'll cover you know some of these other areas in a little bit more detail um but again do not expect to be an expert in this one two hour class um on storytelling and games this is this is a 10 mile high view up of of what storytelling is and why it's important and how it interacts with games and world building you know, and kind of everything else that's out there. So, so let's dive in. And um, again, please, 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 everybody, um, Jonathan, especially, I'm counting on you to ask me lots of questions. You'll be um, in deep trouble this week if you don't. So um, I know this is an area that you are interested in and, and, and don't have a lot of knowledge in it currently. So we're going to change that. And today is the start of that. So please make sure you ask some questions today. So Storylines, you know, in, in general are are something that, you know, kind of go back to the, um, all right, Jonathan, let's do it. Um, Storylines and stuff are, are really as, as old as man is. I think, you know, we've known and, and know that, that mankind has to told stories um, since the very history of mankind. You know, look at the, the caveman drawings that have been on, you know, on the, the cliffs of caves, you know, for millions of years probably, um, and, and how we told stories through pictures, right? And, and, you know, the hieroglyphics and things within, you know, ancient Egypt or, you know, the verbal stories that have been passed down for generations and generations. And, and so it's good to kind of understand that there is, there, there, there's a lot of reasons of why stories are so important to us as human beings. And, and if you begin to kind of understand what it is about stories, if, it, if you really understand what it is that you're trying to do and what you're trying to um, accomplish with stories, then I think it kind of helps you understand that what your goals might be while you're trying to um, write the stories for your games, you know, and, and how you're going to create those and stuff. And that, that it's not just... A, you know, it's just not a bunch of filler. It's not just something that's just kind of there to, to sort of fill up some time and maybe give some context to something or, or you know, give, give people a reason to, to be there. I mean, yes, that is important. And there's many aspects. And I'm, I'm not even going to cover all of them today, you know, but I'll, I'll try to give a lot of examples. Um, but I want to spend a few minutes to really um, get you guys to kind of understand when we talk about a story, what is it? And why is it compelling? And why is it that we need to, whether we're a designer or whether we're a writer, whether we're an artist or anybody else on these game teams, even an audio guy, you know, um, why does story, you know, punctuate, you know, kind of a lot of what we do? So Penny, um, let me answer your questions. I'm currently enrolled in the concept art course. Great. But I'm very curious about how we all work together to create these cool worlds. Can't have concept art without a story. So Absolutely. And this is the challenge. And so, so let me let me first kind of talk about the challenge, you know, to, to answer your question of and, and, uh, and how I guess hard this is, you know, how awkward this is, I guess, for a lot of game teams, you know, in that um, it's kind of that chicken or the egg problem, right? The cart before the horse, as we say, you know, and and who does what and when. And so, depending on your leadership in a game and on a project. Or and really even on a movie um, or anywhere that you begin, right? You you have to begin with ideas, and those ideas can come from many different places. 
Ideas can come from words. You know, a writer can sit down and pen a story, whether that is a, a book or a novel, a short story, you know, a movie script, a TV script. Any of these things can start purely in somebody's mind, right? I mean, it's all starting in our minds, right? But it's going to start there and first become, you know, in, you know, take form in, in a word, right? And those words could be highly flowing and descriptive and, you know, and can be, you know, very elaborate and very detailed. Um, or those words can be very, you know, um, simple. You know, a, a Hollywood writer may define something to just say, you know, the dragon flies in, you know, but does he say like, you know, the 500 meter long dragon with the breeze fire and is green colored with pearlescent skin? And like, does he go into details, right? Does he go into sort of describing it visually for you, right? So, so you, if you're a concept artist and, and, the, and the project begins there, then the, um, you might be given just the word dragon. You might be given a, a description or some kind to start with, right? And now it's up to you to, to um, work with, as a concept artist, whoever is in charge of concept, whether that's yourself or whether that's a art director or a visual designer or somebody else on your project in a game, it might be a creative director or an art director or somebody might give you a little bit more direction. Um, but if you're really good, they might also just say like, you go design a dragon. Like we, we gave you the word dragon. We gave you a little description. Now you go do your job, right? And some people will say, you know, and then you can go off and do something really, you know, elaborate. And you can either choose to stick to, um, the exact idea that that person sort of has, you know, and what fits the universe. And this is, this goes back to the, the last month or more of world building topics that we've talked about. Like, where do the ideas, where's the ideation start from? Right. And so then, you know, um, you might go off and say like, you know, well, I was thinking the dragon should be 200 meters, not 500 meters. And I think he should be purple with red tail. And, you know, and you come up with a whole new design and you might show that to them and say like, here was my idea. And here's why I think this is better. Right. And they may or may not like that. You have to get to know your team, team members. You have to get to know your leadership and the people that are the creative visionaries ultimately at the top and what they want and how much freedom they're willing to give you. Cause not everybody does. Um, I worked for James Cameron for a number of years. Um, for those of you that don't know, I started in movie special effects, um, working on some, a um, little bit of Terminator 2 and on True Lies and some projects with Jim. And, you know, and, and he's known to be, you know, a hard ass and, and he really like, but he knows his stuff really well, like, his, you know, is probably as well as anybody in the industry. And for somebody like Jim, you get to know very quickly that you do exactly what he says. You do not deviate even in the slightest little thing. And, you know, and he has great ideas, but he is just extremely tight and, you know, and, and will just not let you think for yourself. And so after a while, it became uncompelling as an artist to work in that environment because I couldn't use my own brain and use my own ideas. However, I've also worked with other directors and people who were just amazing and they would just kind of give you a direction and then, and then kind of trust you to, to do something and then maybe work with you and iterate with you many times. And so, so it hopefully is a collaborative environment when you're building these worlds and you're building stories, right? But you have to understand in the end, what is the story and what are you trying to achieve with this, right? What is the universe? What is the world about? And does this thing, is this thing strengthen that? Does this thing, you know, make it better? Um, for example, you know, if we were designing a dragon and we're making a world that's really scary and we want something that's really dark and really ominous and, you know, and, and whatever, and then you come out with a, a dragon that's really cute, and really likes to fly and it's, you know, and it's very fun and, that's what you propose to put in this really dark, scary, kind of horrific world. Obviously, it doesn't work. You know, you need something that fits, right? The, the worlds have to fit. The stories have to align. The themes and, you know, those things have to kind of work together, right? And so you, you have to be smart about these things and that we, we can't go off in different directions. But that doesn't mean that we have to stay in a single line in our vision. Our vision can, can vary a little bit as we're working together to kind of create something better. But, but we're doing it with purposeful, you know, um, vision, you know, and, and trying to make something that's, that's really great. So um, you're welcome, Penny. Hopefully this is helping you. Um, so it's, it's a challenge. And again, that ide ideas can come from anywhere. Now, real quick, on the side for myself, um, you know, in the last 
whatever it's been, 15, 20 years now for, for me, you know, I've basically been a creative lead, creative director type person, you know, and the, the things that I do, I'm usually the guy that's either the top of the project or close to it. And I'm, and I'm driving the creative vision for a project. So where does my ideas come from, right? My ideas come from my nightmares and they come from my dreams. They, they come from watching things on TV, books I read, you know, everything that I absorb in media, it, it comes from various things. And, and so I also, you know, we'll just go like Google image search things and look for stuff. I might have an idea of a dragon and I'm like, I don't know what kind of dragon I want. Like what's out there. Right. And I just go do a Google image search and look for dragons. And, you know, I'll save out a hundred images of dragons. I mean, I literally have millions and millions and millions of images on my hard drive um, that I've saved out over the last 20 years. And, um, and I have them all categorized. I put them into genres and then whether they're characters, um, creatures, you know, environments, you know, things like that. And I save all that because I go back and look at it. You know, because I never know when I need another dragon. I never know when I need, you know, something else as a reference, you know, and things. And so, so I will sometimes start with the idea that I just need some kind of big creature. You know, I don't know what that is. And then I'll go try to look and get inspired for something, see if something, you know, makes me excited, you know, and I, and I start there, right? But this is part of storytelling. Where, where does the story and the ideas come from? And then to, to, um, go back again, for those of you that have been with me, the last few weeks, if you if you remember my talk on form and function, this is also really important to, to one last thing before we move on to understand again is everything needs to have form, meaning how does it look? And then the function of, you know, how does it actually work in that world, right? And so form and function have to work together on most things. Now, some stuff can just be pretty. Some stuff can just, you know, work. Um, but in the ideal perfect world, everything has form, everything has function, right? And so story is no different than that. Story is, is trying to combine those two together. Story is, is a part of form. Um, you know, but story also creates function. So, you know, in the, in the case of a quest, if I'm creating a quest, the type of quest that I'm making, that's a function, right? So the story, and the setting this thing up and, and the elaborateness of, of how I set up a story and the characters and what's going on. And then that quest that it's going to send me on, you know, that could be a quest, you know, that, that goes the entirety of the, of the game. Um, you know, I could be, you know, in Lord of the Rings and I got the ring and I got to take it to, you know, to the, to the volcano and throw it in the volcano. And they had one, you know, almost the entirety of the Lord of the Rings series was in essence one giant quest. Right, there was one journey that they were trying to accomplish one thing, but within that, there was a million subplots and things that just kept happening. Right, so so in that case, that one idea, that one thing, you know, led to what the entirety of it is, and so its master plot, its master, you know, essence was really a giant function of the entirety of things that, that the whole story, the whole world, nothing in it made sense unless these people were, were to do this one quest, right? So the quest there did have a function, but it also has the form and that the, the quest and the story is guiding you through a world. And this is, this is becoming compelling for you. And so by, by, pushing you through this journey by pushing you through this world and whether that's throughout the entirety of this adventure that you're putting them on or whether it's just for a few minutes on a little side quest um, that thing has this form and this beauty that brings to it through words you know through visuals you know through all these other things that, that a story brings to make this thing compelling to you in the same way that you know um, a word in my mind in a book can take you to just as many you know transcendental places you know just as good as, you know, uh, watching a movie, right? I mean, how many of us read books versus watch movies? You know, and there's something to be said about what our own imagination can do, right? So don't undervalue words and stories, right? But but they're also the same as, as visuals. They're also the same as art, right? And so let's dig into that. Let's understand that. Let's understand how do we create these worlds for people, both in their own minds, on the screen, on paper, wherever we are creating it for them. But how do we create it and make it magical, right? How do we create something special? You know, and, and what are these techniques that we use? And what are going to be these ways that we can create something that just is unforgettable, right? And that's what I want to talk about today. And so 
Um, hopefully that will inspire you guys a little bit and get you to really understand that that story is just, I can't underestimate and, you know, uh, undervalue like how important the story is for a project. And so I really want you to take that to heart. This is not just a simple little thing where you go hire a writer and, and outsource it to somebody because it's just this pain in the butt on the side that you, that you have to deal with. Right. I mean, it's not to say that gameplay is not important or that other things are not important, but, but story is, is that glue that binds it all together and makes it special. It really is. So, um, Tony also, howdy, how are you doing? So thanks for joining us. All right. So narrative, um, you know, I'll read this really quick. A narrative story or tale is an account of a series of related events or experiences, whether fictional or non-fictional. Narratives can be presented through a sequence of written or spoken words, still or moving images, or any combination of these. So this was, you know, out of Wikipedia, um, you know, as a definition. But but I want you to, to understand that that both words and, and pictures, right, are are ways of creating what we call narrative, right? And, and narrative is the core foundation for what the story is. And so it's again important for you to understand why you know why we create these things and what we are um doing you know and that in the end what's really um important here to me is that we're creating these these events or experiences right and so that's what we're trying to get at here is these experiences right and and what is that user experience you know for the game so a story tells us about an event or a series of events, either real or fictional, made up. Stories are told to interest, entertain, and teach us. Stories help us connect with others, communicate ideas, and imagine life's possibilities. Even the most basic stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So this kind of covers a few things. And again, this is this is 101, you know, most basics, you know, of what a story is. This is what you're learning in school, right? So I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I, but I want to, you know, I want you to really understand that, that these basis for what we do are really important, right? And, um, and it's important to understand that there's, um, I think again, these, these, these words here, they interest us. So in a game, like it's something that, that keeps us interested in the world, Right. It's something that, that compels us that we go like, wow, this is really entertaining. This is, you know, I want to find out more. So the stories can be something that drive and push and pull a player through a game. They can be something that really allows them to escape this world and get into this new world. Right. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to come, we're trying to create these immersive experiences that, that people just fall in love with and that they can lose, you know, themselves in for a time. And that's what games are really about. And especially when you're when you're designing role playing games, you know, and, and some of these more immersive, larger scale games, you know, it really is about you know building a fantasy. And I'm not talking about fantasy meaning you know Dungeons and Dragons kind of fantasy. We're talking about fantasy just in that it's a it's a new, unique experience. It takes you to a new place, a new world, a new time, a place you know that's not your own troubled life. Right? It allows you to escape. You know, and that's what these stories are doing. You know, but they're also fun. They, they make us laugh. They make us cry. They make us happy, you know, and sad and all these things all put together if we do it right, you know, and, and through that becomes entertainment, you know, and it's something that we look forward to. It's something that, that we want, you know, and, and, and we, you know, want every day to wake up, you know, and play that game or read that story or whatever, because it's so compelling. It's always in our mind. And if we're really successful as writers and creators, that's the type of you know experience that we're really trying to, to create. And then teaching us, you know, stories, you know, have, have a lot of power, you know, and there's a lot that can be there. And so, so when we talk about teaching players, you know, yes, we can teach them tutorials. We can teach them how to play the game. We can teach them how to move through the game. We can teach them, you know, a lot of that kind of stuff that, that has to do with what, you know, um, goes on within the game itself. But there's a lot more that games can teach. And I'm not talking about educational games. And that is applicable too. But think about what we can do as designers, as educators, as teachers about, like, how do we teach people, whether it's directly, indirectly, you know, um, in different ways about 
you know, topics that maybe they don't know about. Maybe it's history. Maybe we have, you know, a game like Age of Empires or Assassin's Creed or something like that that takes you back into the past and you get to learn about ancient civilizations. You get to learn about historical figures. You get to learn about bad things that kind of happened and wars and, and those kinds of things. But it can also teach us morality. It can teach us, you know, rights and wrongs. It can teach us, you know, a lot of different things like that that are, um, the, are kind of interesting and there, there's be some gray areas there where you kind of can maybe push some limits and you know and, and try to help people understand and, and interact with their stories and not just read it not just watch it but play through it experience it right that's the power of games is that experiencing what you're trying to put them into right and so when you're experiencing the game versus and that means playing it right so you're experiencing it and you're interacting with the game you're interacting with the world the people in it you're not just passively watching something like you know on television and so games has a lot more power there it has a lot more to show you you know that you can take different paths you can take different journeys you can do right or do wrong and see the consequences there right and so that's where this teaching us isn't necessarily literal and figural in the sense that like oh you know we're going to teach you how to build a telescope you know or we're going to teach you you know how the moon you know rotates you know the earth or some sort of science or math or history or whatever i mean there there is very literal teachings you know and teaching that goes on in storytelling but think of this as an opportunity to use your stories to use your worlds to to you know try new things to really inspire this next generation, you know, that's going to play your game, you know, that's going to, to, to live this experience. And what can you teach them, right? And what can you, you know, as a responsible human being, you know, give back to the world and give back to these kids and these players and do in a way, even if it's subtle, that helps them maybe become a better person, right? There, there's lots of ways to think about teaching. And I won't get off on too big of a rant here because that's a, a tough topic. But I just want to inspire you guys to think about as game designers, how can we do better? And how can we use our stories? You know, and how can we use the power of our words, the powers of our visuals, and the powers of our ideas to inspire and make people um, better, right? And so that's something that we have the power to do, right? And so that's um, a challenge. And we also have to be careful not to abuse that power, right? And that's where the stories can be really tricky. Actually, as a side note, it's this is something that some of my students today brought up and I think this is a it's a tough question because sometimes in history um, things are not always you know in history and politics and in the real world a lot of things that we would present in a game or in a movie or a book or something may not necessarily be politically correct or may not be uh, you know people may not approve it or, or or want it in the way that that we would do it so we may follow reality we may follow something that is you know very um you know, real, you know, and we know 100% that this is what the facts were of something. Um, but yet, quite often people will follow the Hollywood version of a story or they'll, they'll follow what the game version of, of something else was. So take a movie like Braveheart, for example, or Gladiator or some big Hollywood movie. Those stories are not 100% accurate. Those stories were glamorized and brought up to make them more exciting, to make a better movie, you know, and they, they, follow, they follow history for a while, but they deviate in many different ways. It's a tough problem for us as entertainers, um, but also as teachers, right? Like, at what point do we make something exciting? At what point do we make something real and truthful and educational, right? And and so, as game designers, we're going to be faced with this a lot. Like, when do we tell the truth? When do we, uh, you know, admit things just because we want it to be a simpler story? Or how, when do we admit things because we don't want to exactly talk about the truth for some reason right and and maybe it's because the truth is too horrible um whatever the case is we we have a lot of problems like this that come into our lives i've had to face this many times in dealing with many games especially historical games where i've had to make hard decisions about what topics do i cover and how exactly do i cover certain topics in my stories because they were sensitive and so this is something that you have to be um be that way yeah jonathan the movie 300 um is um definitely an example of one that was very 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 loose on what was historically accurate right it was fun it was compelling it was a great movie but definitely like you know very far from accurate right and so those are the kinds of things and I actually worked on a 300 game and, and, um, on one of the 300 movies and, and it's, um, 
it's definitely a, a tough line to, to, to walk when you're trying to make something entertaining, right? And so just understand that as you're, as you're thinking about your stories, as you're thinking about your worlds, sometimes you might need to answer some questions before you get too deep into the woods, you know, weeds and, and you get too far into it, like trying to understand what are you really making here and what are your rules, you know, for this world? You know, what, what are your rules about accuracy, historical accuracy, about telling the truth versus, you know, what is okay to, to talk about, not talk about. Um, even just, you know, simple things. One of my students today brought up, you know, um, in a um, recent popular game um, that was based in World War II, um, that they had female um, soldiers. And they were, you know, kind of highly publicizing the fact that they had female soldiers, you know, in World War II, which, you know, it was inaccurate. You know, in, the, in this particular battle, in this particular area, there, there actually was no females that were fighting in the war at that time. Um, so is that, you know, okay? Like, you know, we're trying to make sure that women are better represented in games. You know, we're doing it for, to maybe make it a little bit more popular with women, whatever the case is. But we broke historical accuracy by doing that. And so at some point we have to decide, is that something we, that we are okay doing? Right. And something that's that's worth us doing. So the next thing that's that's a, a challenging topic to talk about and, and, and a little bit because it's a little hard to explain um, for some people. Um, but there's this idea that there is the game story, which is the stories. You know, and again, I'll use the stories like anything that, that the team creates, anything that you as the game designers, the artists, whoever create that, that are pre-generated stories and content and things like that are, are the game stories, right? So the game stories are, are there to make it compelling. They're there to drive the player, you know, through um, the world in a certain way and, and to, you know, give him quests and give him, you know, all these things that we'll talk about today about why stories are important. However, I need you to understand that there's also what we call player stories. Now, player stories are not stories that we write. These are not stories that we create. These are stories that the players themselves will create while they play your game and while they experience it. And both of these can live together. Um, and both of these often do live together. However, some games do, t do opt for something where the, the player basically and the player stories is all there really is in the game. That the player's gameplay and what the player does during the game becomes his story. Right, so there, there's no cutscenes. There's no actual real story. You drop the player into the experience. Um, this is often done, especially in VR games and things that are more immersive. Um, and they drop you into it, and then what you do in the game, ultimately in your mind, becomes the story. I went and did this. I killed this guy. I went over here and saved the princess. I fought a dragon. You know, and and so the the story itself uses little to no you know, or say the game itself uses very little to no story. You know, there's not fancy dialogues and cutscenes, and, you know, all these kinds of things. Now there is indirect story going on because there's still art. There's still a world. There's still things in there that are, you know, kind of subtly, you know, subliminally telling stories, right? But it's a much more subtle craft of storytelling in that we, we don't, for example, give the player character a name, you know, in this case, like quite often we let the player choose his own name or, or we write script in such a way that the player character never has a name that the player himself can take on the persona of the player character, you know, and then he goes into this world being who he is, you know, and, and stuff. And there's not a right or wrong answer here. Whether you have a, a, a licensed name character, you're playing James Bond, you know, or you're playing, you know, whoever that character is in that story, or whether you have a generic, you know, character that that is um, the player maybe enters his own name into it, you know, in the in the beginning, and the and the game responds and remembers the the player character's text that he entered, or whether it's just you know dialogue is written and stories are written in such a way that um, the the player's never directly referred to is like him or her or you, you know, or a specific name or whatever, right? But these stories are written or designed in such a way that, that it can be very generic, right? And so so these are stories that are not directly created by the game designers, you know, but again, these are these are stories that come about through player actions. 
And so, and these ultimately kind of turn into what we call the water cooler conversations, right? So this is quite often the the thing at work. And this does not mean that game stories cannot be water cooler conversations, right? But quite often, this is where these become compelling because it again becomes about my experience as a player. So it's about you know me having ownership, you know me feeling like I have what's called player autonomy, you know that that I have this illusion of freedom. Um, you know, that, that I can go in there, that I'm immersed in this experience, that I can go in and be who I want to be, play the way I want to play, you know, and do what I want to do. And this is often seen, especially in open world games or RPGs, you know, that are more open world, um, that we give, we give either full freedom or what I call the illusion of freedom, right? And, and we give them that way to experience these stories either in a non-linear way or in other factors that, the that, that are, different and interesting right and so keep this in mind that that i think in the, in the in the perfect world we need a little bit of both we need to understand that there's game stories that are more scripted they're more there they're higher quality they're going to be better they're going to be more compelling um for a lot of people but don't overlook the player stories and don't overlook the importance of what player stories are and that, you know, giving immersion and, and the autonomy or the illusion of autonomy, again, that, that feeling, that sense that I have control, when in reality, there really is one way to go and not a thousand or whatever, right? You, you can control how and where players, you know, go through, the, go through this world. So I just want you guys to sort of understand that there, there's often two schools of thought when it comes to storytelling. And this is kind of just an important side piece to sort of understand that, again, there's no rights or wrongs here. This is purely your preference of how do you want the story to unfold and what kinds of stories do you want the player to be involved in throughout it. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But please ask questions if that wasn't, if that wasn't clear. So one of the things... Um, that's important is that you need to understand what the player's motivations are in the game, you know, and ultimately, you know, there, this is a, a deep, deep, deep question, you know, that's actually kind of hard to answer um, because it comes at so many different levels, you know, and so the, the kind of who am I, what am I, what am I doing, why am I motivated, you know, why, you know, and, and again, abstract this out to whether you're writing a movie or a game or whatever. The, the, the same problem exists in that ultimately, you know, the, the player or the, the character, the hero, whatever you want to call them, needs motivation. And I'd even argue that the bad guy needs motivation, right? And, the, and the, you know, all of the characters in the game or in the, in the movie in this world ultimately have something that motivates them, right? The bad guy might be after money. The bad guy might be after revenge. You know, whatever it is, he's motivated by something as well, right? And then, and then your player character is often also driven by something, you know, and that could be, you know, a sense of duty. You know, he might be a policeman or, or, or a military officer or something like that. And he's motivated by honor. He's motivated, you know, by something along that lines. Um, he might be motivated by, you know, um, revenge. You know, if you look at a, a movie like John Wick or something like that, where, you know, they, they kill his dog or kill his girlfriend or, you know, do something bad to your family, um, you know, those become motivations for, for why we are going to go do what we're going to do, right? And so at the very beginning and the early parts of a story, we need to set up our player motivations. And we need to understand that that becomes this, this key foundation for why we do what we do, right? And, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about the hero's journey, but often this is a reluctant motivation. Quite often, um, the players, you know, or the heroes of the story, um, kind of get a call to adventure as we as we'll call it and and somebody kind of like nudges them a little bit and um and they're like no nah, i don't want to go you know no nah, i don't want to go you know it's just like I, i'm i'm happy here on the couch you know um eating cheetos and playing video games like why would i want to go out in the bad world and, and go fight you know um aliens right and then somebody finally pushes them off the cliff and they're go ah! it's like well i'm going to fight aliens because they just blew up my house and killed my dog and you know and they're trying to destroy the world so i don't have a choice anymore right and so 
So sometimes, even in the stories, we have to push the people over the ledge, right? We've, we've got to, we, you know, we, we tease them initially, we give them a little bit of a choice, but, you know, the reality is that, that that story can push and pull. That story can, you know, can lure the player to it. It can be enticing. Come to me. Come to me. You want to play me. You want to see what's next. You know, and some, some players are like, woo, yes, I want to come. You know, and then the next set of players are like, ah, eh, you know, why am I going over there? And you're like, boom, you know, go over there. I don't care. You know, and, you know, the carrot of the stick, right? And stories, you know, have that ability. They have that that power to push and to pull, you know, and to, to you know, get people excited to go someplace or make it so dangerous or hazardous that they don't want to, you know, to go there. Now, as an aside, something to also keep in mind is is remember that, um, that players and themselves – so if I am the player and I'm the one playing the game, I'm a real human and I've got the controller in my hand, I'm the player, right? Now, in the game, if we're playing a third-person game, predominantly, sometimes a first-person game, but if we are playing a game with a player character, um, and this gets back to our last side of, you know, is this person, you know, a known character um, in the, you know, in the game or is it is this person kind of you? This is where the, the, the gray area can get into, Um but you have to be careful because player motivations and emotions and things like this um, are both within the player character and within, or sorry, within the player character and within the player. And so the player himself can have a totally different emotional arc and a fully different set of motivations than what the player's character currently does and is feeling. And quite often we get those confused. Quite often we talk about the player and the player is this, you know, this is both the the player character himself and, you know, or the player himself and the player character. And we don't realize that, you know, for example, the player character in the game might be scared. It might be, you know, trembling and, you know, and having all these emotional responses. But if you've not done your job right, if you've not built that stuff up within the player, the player is like, "Eh, why is he scared? Like, come on, you know, get with it. Like, stop being you know, such a wimp, like, you know, get going. Like, I, I'm not scared. Like, I'm going to run, I want to run in fighting right now. Like, you know, why am I scared? You know? And so you have to be careful to be sympathetic to these emotions and to the motivations, you know, of your stories as you, as you play with the game, right? Because the game characters and the, and the players themselves can get disconnected. And through that disconnection, um, becomes an emotional disconnect between the two that, that can make the player himself feel uncomfortable. Jonathan, um, yeah, exactly. So some games feel off for me when I feel like I can't connect with a game character, and that's exactly part of the problem, right? Because you're wanting, you know, that game character to do, a game character is doing something different than what you expected it to do. Another common problem are things like in motivation. Um, you know, we might have a player character in the game. He might, we might, and I'm trying to remember the name of the game that just did this and, and it bothered me a lot. In like the first minute of the game, you know, the player character's there and I think it was even the opening cutscene. The player's wife, player character's wife, um, also shows up in the game, you know, in a cutscene, you know, and like somebody drives by and kills her and then um, I'm supposed to feel motivated because they just killed my wife and the, the entire motivation um, for me to go on this big journey and go on this big revenge plot was was them killing my wife, you know, in front of me at the very start of the of the game. However, I as a player have not built any emotional attachment to this person. Who, yes, she's my player character's wife, but I've only seen her for the last ten seconds, and so I don't care if she lives or dies. Like I, I don't even know who she is, and so now you're telling me that my motivation is based on my player character and not off the player. So that's done a lot. And that's the cheap route out. That's the the easy route out. Um, But it disconnects to Jonathan's point of that. You don't connect with your character now because you feel like, again, they're doing something that that is not something you would have done. And it just, you you feel disjointed there. Um, And so that's something you want to be careful of. And so if you have time, um, if you can try to to build in something where you know maybe the first level of the game allows you to play with your wife right maybe you go with her on a thing and you have to save her you have to protect her 
you know, and you you build up some emotional attachment to her, you know, as a player, right? And and so you suddenly like you know like this girl a lot, and you're and she's tagging along with you in the game, and you know, and you're doing whatever, and you feel you know motivated and getting to know her, and you like her, and all these things, and then she dies, right? Now I'm pissed off. Like I'm like, what the hell? Like I thought she was going to be with me the whole game, and now you just killed her, right? Now I'm actually kind of pissed, you know, and so so. Build those connections, you know, in the same way in real life that, you know, if some random stranger walked in front of you, you know, and dies, you're not going to, I mean, yeah, we're going to be shocked that somebody died, but outside of that, we're like, who are they? You know, versus your best friend dying or your partner dying in front of you, you know, in real life is going to have a much, much, much stronger emotional, you know, attachment, right? And so, so keep that in mind. Try to within you, even your games and your stories, if something's a really strong, anchor that needs to become a, a strong point of emotional attachment you need to to build that into your gameplay build that into your story if you can that allows you to build that actual attachment and, and stuff for the player himself and not just assume that the player character's assumed attachment to it will be a strong enough motivation for you you know as a player to feel that that same attachment um so penny yeah i totally get that emotion is a big thing for me that's why I love games like Mass Effect. You feel connected and part of the story. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's and that's that difference that the the, the well wrapped, well crafted games, especially Bioware and companies that are masterful at storytelling. Um, you know, the, the, that's why those games are so good, right? So speaking of emotions, ta da! Um, so you know, it really is um, everything. Um, to um, have strong emotions in games. And, um, and in fact, I will... Let me Google this for you really quick, just as a shameless plug, but I think this is important. If you guys can find... Um, oops. Um, all right. So here... Um, so if you guys can see this here real quick... So this book here um, is, is called Creative Emotions in Games. It's a little bit old, um, but I think you can you should still be able to find it. Um, I believe it's still on. Um, let's see if it's still here on Amazon. Um, yeah, so it looks like you could probably still find it. Probably used. It's not too expensive. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend going out and and buying um, this book. Uh, it's a shameless plug because the the author David Freeman is one of my best friends. And so, and somebody I've known for 15 years and I've worked with on a number of games. Um, but David's book is incredibly good and, and probably the best reference for um, techniques, really, really, really like significant techniques for how to create emotion in games. And David is honestly probably the master of this and studied this um, in depth and things. So, so please, you know, if you're all interested in, in storytelling, writing and emotions, please check out this book. I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I still use it as a reference um, because he literally just goes into and he'll say like, here's 52 techniques of like how you deepen a story or here's 22 techniques of how you make a character more interesting, things like that. And he, he just literally has just these incredibly useful lists that I just find, you know, um, super, super handy to do. So again, pick up this book, Creating Emotion in Games by David Freeman. Um, you'll, you'll thank me later. It's definitely, um, just an amazing book on the topic of emotions and in games. And so, um, you can't go wrong with, with this. So, all right, commercial over. <laughs> so, um, yep, Jonathan, I just, I saw that today that they're, um, Bethesda is making the Indiana Jones game. And, um, yeah, I'm very, very curious about that to, to, to learn about that. And supposedly they're rebooting, um, the, Indiana, the next Indiana Jones movie I heard today too, and supposedly maybe Harrison Ford is out, and I don't remember the actor's name. The guy that played in the last Jurassic Park, Jurassic World um, movies, I think is going to take his place. Was the rumor as well? So it sounds like they're kind of rebooting that whole thing, you know, again. And I don't know. There was another announcement yesterday about um, they're calling it Lucasfilm Games. So instead of Lucas Arts, you know, back in the heyday, I worked for Lucas Arts which was the game company that was part of the George Lucas company. Um, they put out kind of a teaser, I believe it was yesterday or the day before, about Lucasfilm games. And it sounds like they're trying to do more in the game space. Now, I know that they've been licensing out just 
stuff in general. Um, the Star Wars things and, and games especially have been licensed out to a bunch of people. But it does sound like they're going to get more into just the, the Lucas IPs in general. Similar to what they've been doing with Pixar and, and, and you know... Star Wars a little bit, you know, and everything else. I think they're going to, you know, it sounds like now Indiana Jones is coming and all that. So it's very exciting. You know, definitely one of my favorite franchises as a kid. So um, I'm I'm personally super excited about that and love just the, the popcorn movie indie stuff. You know, it's not super deep, but it's just the perfect balance for me of just fun, fun and adventure, right? All right. So back to emotions. The commercial is over. Um, and, um, you know, it's, we talked about this, you know, having the player emotions, the player character emotions, right. And, and understanding, um, how those two vary. And we also have to see that the NPCs in the game also have emotion, right? So kind of everyone and everything has some level of emotion in it. And, and those emotions can be shown through, you know, dialogues. It can be, you know, the words they say. Are they, are they you know, and, and through that, even their, their facial expressions, their, their animations, the way they're dressed, you know, everything can be emotions, right? Emotion really is best if it's, if it's served with attitude. You know, you've got anger and you're, ha- you know, you're happy and you're sad and, you know, and all these things, right? We, we learn to, to understand emotions as human beings in a lot of ways, right? And, and so we need to understand that that same level of emotion and the intensity that emotion brings to our stories can be more than just a character standing there with a text dialogue above his head going, I am very angry. You know, it's like, it doesn't exactly exasperate the point of emotion, right? And so emotion can be, you know, the guy's chasing you through the street with a knife. The guy is, you know, shooting at you. The guy's yelling at you and he's blood curdling screaming you know and emotions cover these far ranges it's not black and white it's it's barely even gray it's just this this far range of things that 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 make you know the story the characters the world and everything in it you know a lot more interesting right and so so you know emotions can be preset uh, but you also can be you know things that that potentially could be player triggered based on player actions or what the player says or what the player does, right? And so this is where the worlds become even more compelling, you know, and that the worlds, you know, and what the player does, you know, if the player says something angry, does the, does the person I'm talking to get upset? Do they cry? Do they get sad? You know, um, you know, do they get angry back? You know, does that fit their personality? Right. Um, and, and stuff. And so, um, you, you need to kind of understand, you know, again, what are these these things that trigger emotions, right? And then, um, as an aside, you know, how do we use that in gameplay, right? How can we can we take this farther? Because emotions, an emotional reaction, make something compelling, make a story compelling, right? Um, and so, if there's not emotion in it, then, then we're just flat, right? If the if the, the whole thing is just kind of doldrums, you know, we're not going to be all that interested in the story. But emotions definitely get us, you know, a little bit of adrenaline here, a little bit of sadness here. You know, all these things affect us biochemically, you know, and these are things that basically heighten, you know, the, the user experience a lot. Um, so, so keep in mind that emotion really attaches the player physically to your product, right? To your story. You know, if you, you know, I don't care whether you're writing a book or, or making a movie, a TV show or making a game, you know, if you can make somebody cry, if you can make somebody angry, you know, if you can make somebody happy, like truly happy in that product, you've succeeded. You're like you've you've probably done a really good job, you know, and that person's probably going to finish that product. That person is is so into it. They're so compelled by it, you know, and they're so interested in it that it, that it gave them strong enough emotions for them to actually physically feel it. Um, that says a lot. You know, that, that's a lot more, you know, it's like somebody laughing out loud in a movie or screaming when they're scared or something like that. That is a much stronger emotion than just watching somebody, you know, watch a movie that's, oh, wow, well, that's scary. Okay. You know, you know, you don't want to have that flat emotion, right? You want people to feel emotion, you know, and so your job as a game designer and a storyteller is to, to understand of how to build emotional connection with people, how to build emotions that really are strong. But you have to understand that emotions also need to change over time. 
you know, emotions have pacing, you know, and they have to contrast with each other, you know, and so you can't be happy all the time. You can't be scared all the time. You can't be angry all the time, right? The contrasting of emotions is what, as human beings, makes our lives a lot more interesting. And that's what makes us much more compelled to be, you know, human beings. It's the ups and the downs, you know, that really make us humans, right? And so um, we'll get more into this in a little bit when we talk about pacing. But keep in mind that emotions need to often have polar opposites. You know, that, that when you're doing... Um, and building emotional experiences, you really want to understand happy and sad. And how do I do both, you know, together, right? And that's something that, that is really tricky. Uh, when I worked at Ubisoft and was working on like the Rainbow Six games and things like that, um, that was something that was actually a required document for us to write. Um, and, a, and a presentation that I actually had to give to the executives was about the emotions in the games. And I had to show them, you know, at all these different levels, and it's very complicated. What are the, what's the player's emotions? What's the player character's emotions? What are these other emotions that are going on in the world? And how are these shifting over time? How do they contrast? You know, how do I make the player himself happy? How do I make the player character happy? You know, things like that. We went into a tremendous amount um, of detail in these areas. So keep that in mind that, that emotions are critical and emotions need to contrast and vary in their intensities if you really want them to be successful. All right, Abodi, hi there. Um, let me read your comment here. What do you think is the most important thing to start with when learning video game design? Video game programming, design, directing, thank you for advance, um, and stuff. So, unfortunately, it's a, it's a tough topic. Um, well, you're welcome to, to DM me on the side. You know, I'd be happy to um, um, go in there because it's not um, an easy topic. I do have other, um, a number of other videos um, on this channel, um, over 50 hours of other videos on there with a bunch of them talking about what it's like to be a game designer, different roles in game designers, how to get started as a game designer. Um, and so those are multi-hour long conversations. Um, I'm happy to have that conversation with you separately. Otherwise, please go, go watch those, um, you know, those videos to kind of get a better sense of what a game designer is. Um, but in short, to answer your question, a game designer needs to understand fun. And, and a game designer does not need to be an artist. They do not need to be a programmer. So they are, you know, and they need to really understand what is compelling and what makes a game fun. And, while directing is something that a lot of you know game designers aspire to, um, to be like myself, to be a director, really, you know, is, is what I am. Um, you're not going to be a director day one, so you might be you know looking at your five or ten year plan to to become a, a, a director, and that is something that a lot of people aspire to. Um, but as a game designer, it's going to take you a while. You got a lot to learn. You got a lot to do before you become a game director. So the idea of learning how to direct and being a director is something that's going to um, be some years of, of learning and training and study and practice to really become. And so that's definitely not somewhere there. So you want to really start in game design, you know, learning gameplay, game systems, and level design, and learning you know how to make the, the, the game fun. And stuff like that. And that's where we get started. And that's what my, my game design course at CG Spectrum is all about that. Um, and it really focuses people on just the fun. And we, we touch on art and technology and things like that. Just brief enough that you have an understanding of it. But it really is all about understanding fun. All right. So moving right along here. At a slow snail's pace. But hopefully this is um, compelling for everybody. And, and again, I'm trying to, in this whole series, um, really deep dive in these topics um, and really trying to drive some points home. Um, I think quite often, even in my own course, we, we, we talk about a lot of this stuff, but we go so fast um, that I just don't have the time to, to get in there and really try to teach you what's important, right? And so, so hopefully these live streams have become kind of a soapbox for me to get up on and, and, and preach some of the, the, um, these more difficult topics and really make them compelling for you, you know, and, and really deep dive into how we're going to do things. And to, to reiterate again, um, probably starting, I think, unless, you know, I, unless I come up with another idea around world building, um, we're probably going to have one more week of, of 
something continuing this storytelling talk. And then after that, we're going to start building a game together. And we're going to really show you guys how to, you know, how to build a game. Um, and we're going to start with a blank page and we're going to build something together. You guys are going to help me design a game, you know, in real time. And it might take us months. You know, we'll see how far and how long it takes us, you know, a couple hours a week. But but I want um, everyone to see how how hard it is because it's a lot harder than people realize. And so just so you know, that's where we're working towards and where we're going to get to here very soon. So what is story? You know, um, this is kind of a broad topic, but, but you know, story, when we talk about it in a game, has so many different purposes, right? It, it's information that you need to know, right? You need to know like, you know, what, what is it um, um, in the, you know, in the world? What is it within the gameplay? What is it within the universe? You know, and, and what are those things that I need to know? And, and you know, and, and some of that is required. You know, some of that's optional. You know, some of that's just kind of for fun. Some of that's to make the world itself a little bit better, more interesting place or a little bit bigger place. Um, you know, some of these can be issue that, that helps the, the gameplay. Um, and some of this can be stuff that just, you know, is there, um, is fluff, right? And so some of it could be information that literally is like, go do this, right? A quest might tell you, you know, go kill 12 boar, you know, off in the Aldernwood Forest, you know, to, to get a, a medal. And you kind of go like, okay, that's pretty clear. Like I go to this point, I kill the 12 boar, I come back, you know, ta-da, I get my, my reward, right? That's information, right? It's, it's telling me something. But information could also be things like games like Far Cry do this masterfully and others where you might have two NPCs talking, right? And you see this in like um, Far Cry 5 and some different games where if you, if you sneak up, and you're really quiet and you get into the to the bushes, you know, by these two guys and you listen and you hear them talking, you know, and they're like, you know, we're short staffed tonight and the back door is not guarded, you know, and we don't know what to do. So I, I really hope nobody attacks tonight. And you're like, ha, huh, hmm, the back door is not guarded. Hmm, back door is open. So maybe I should sneak around to the back door. Clue, right? So, so there's a way of using information. There's a way of, of you just overheard some story. You learned some story that gave you optional but useful information. Like I could have just pulled my gun out, shot both guys and not even taken the time to listen and tried to walk through the front door. But the alarm would have gone off. A thousand more guards would have come streaking in. And um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, but that's the way I choose to play. But you need to be aware that 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 information, if, I, if I'm careful or I play a certain way, that information, again, allowed me to play the game in a new way and understand the game in a new way that made it interesting and compelling for some players, right? So some players want to sneak in. Some players want to go in guns blazing, right? There, in a lot of these open world games, you can do both. But that information that the game systems just provided you, you know, just by overhearing a conversation, um, can help you, right? I've seen other fantasy games where if you go and listen in town, you know, and I was like trying to find this dragon and I overheard a conversation, you know, and somebody said like, you know, two NPCs again were talking, you know, and I overheard one of them say like, oh, they sighted some dragon remains up on some mountain. And I was like, oh, wait, I haven't been up there yet. Like that must be where the dragon is that I'm looking for. And sure enough, that's where it was. But it took me taking the time to listen and pay attention to the story and, and through that, it gave me a clue and a hint. And I would have eventually found it on my own, you know, just by exploring and looking. But by listening to that information, by overhearing that story, it, it gave me a clue and it gave me a hint um, through that information that, that um, helped me a lot. And it saved me a lot of time. Um, so, um, Bodhi, you can, you can um, send me a... a message on my email um let me put it here um that's my email there and if any of you want to to um pm you know private message me that's um usually the the best place to to reach me all right, so, um, but story, you know, can give 
lots of details in the role. It can, it can, it can provide things that are emotional. Um, and, and emotions, again, can, can cover a lot of different means. You know, for example, like, you know, there is a, a scene in Far Cry 5. And one of our mentors, Andreas, um, set up this scene in, in Far Cry. Um, and, and it's a very compelling scene because he wanted to have these terrorists, um, I believe it was in actually in Africa. So I'm not sure if terrorist is the right word, so forgive me, but the bad guys who are out there trying to, um, um, you know, take over this whole area and they go into this village and, you know, and they start killing people, right? And Andreas wanted to make sure that, that we saw the, 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 we saw the atrocities. We needed to see and we needed to feel the pain that these villagers were going through, these poor civilians who were being slaughtered. You know, and he had to create this very elaborate set of scripts and environments and things like that, um, you know, to um, to work with. And um, because he didn't want you just to come into a village. And so, so part, like, if you wanted to have, like, part of the emotional experience, right? You could have, you could have come into a village. It could have been burned down already, or it's on fire, you know, and it just was recently burned or it just was, you know, whether it's an hour ago or a day ago, whatever, it's smoldering, it's on fire, you know, and you see dead bodies everywhere, right? And you see women and children, you see heads cut off, you see atrocities like you've never experienced before. And you, and you feel bad about that. Like you feel, um, you know, that like, God, something really bad did happen here. And, and then you, you feel more compelled, you know, and kind of angry at some levels. You, that when you go kill the bad guys, you feel a little bit more justified. You're like, yeah, these are pretty bad guys. Like, I don't mind, you know, um, killing them, right? And so, so that is one layer of, of emotional attachment, right? Seeing the, 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 what the bad guys are doing, seeing and, and experiencing that is, is, is one layer. The next layer is like, do I, can I really truly experience it? Right. And, and do I go into this village like Andreas set up and now I actually see them killing the guys and he scripted stuff so that it would happen just seconds before I could do it. And we'd see somebody run out and boom, they get shot and the terrorists would run out. And then I had a chance to kill the terrorists, but I didn't have that chance to stop it. And so I felt helpless, you know, and, and things. And so, so there my emotions got even more you know, more built up, more anxiety, more frustration, more anger, because I felt like if I'd been a little faster, if I'd been a little better, maybe I could have helped them. Maybe I could have stopped them. Right. And that's where my, my emotions, you know, really got worked up there. It was a really great scene, you know, and, and then you could take it maybe even farther where like, do I have the choice to, to save them or not save them? You know, do I have the choice to save the man or the woman or the child? I can save one, but not all three. Who do I save? Right. Um, those kinds of things elicit strong emotions in people, right? Like those kinds of things, um, and those dilemmas, you know, and, and stuff, or do I save this person or do I grab the box that has a million dollars in it? You know, um, like, hmm, like which, which moral dilemma do I play in, right? So emotions and stories can be set up to be interactive. They don't have to be things that are just, you know, passive. They don't have to be things that we just encounter or experience, but they can tell stories in, you know, in many different ways, right? And they can create emotions and, and the, the reasons, again, for why are we doing these things, right? And, and so, so it's kind of back to that same story of my, you know, my wife getting killed in the, in the beginning of the movie, you know, the beginning of the game. And I, don't, I didn't care you know, because that was, um, you know, I wasn't emotionally attached to them yet, right? And so, so the more that we can build that up within the games, the more that we feel emotional attachment to the other player characters, if there is any, to good guys and bad guys and all these kinds of things, the more that we can strengthen the emotions, you know, it, it's going to help. But, but story, it is hard as emotion. That's really, you know, a lot of what it is, right? And so, so just be aware of that, you know, and, and it gives us the reasons, you know, directly or, in, or indirectly for why we're doing what we're doing, Right. And so, you know, I think just be aware of that. Um, keep in mind that the, a lot of story can be fiction or nonfiction. Hmm. Um, meaning it can be made up, or, you know, and, and be fantasy. It can be, you know, or it can be real, right? And so we might be doing, you know, both. You know, we might be doing something that's, that's um, completely made up. Um, it might be something that's like a James Bond, you know, story where it's taking place in exactly today's world 
and the world events and the current events are 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 known to us. They're, they're, they're familiar. We go like, this is my world. This is the world I live in. Like, I know this world, right? But wait a second. Does James Bond live in my world? I mean, James Bond is a fictional character, right? James Bond is a character that does not exist in the real world. But you can put that character into our real world, into our current events, and then have a couple things out there that, that are very fantastical, you know, and definitely probably don't exist. But if done right, it feels compelling. It feels like, wow, maybe that really did happen, you know, and, and maybe I just didn't know about it. Maybe the, you know, there was some secret service, you know, um, whatever, you know, thing that happened, you know, and the spies, you know, averted some big attack and alien invasion and whatever, and we just never knew about it, right? And, and wow, that actually kind of seemed plausible, you know, and so the, the stories can do that, right? It doesn't have to be all made up. It doesn't have to be all current events. Like they, you can intermix these things carefully together. And same thing with history and, and alternate histories and, and things like that, or even mythologies. And mythologies and histories often blend together. Um, so the, there's a lot of these things that that allow us to play in the, in the gray areas, the play in the lights and the darknesses and everything in between as we're telling these stories to make them compelling, to make them interesting and to, you know, and then hopefully even to understand and sort out what's truths, what are the lies, you know, is, is this thing, you know, really happening and, you know, and who is, um, you know, really telling me the truth and not and things like that. Um, and so, so those kinds of things can be really, really interesting to kind of see and play with. Um, speaking of which, I was just, I'm trying to remember the name of it now and I can't remember. Oh gosh, I should know it because I watched it this weekend. There's a, there's a Liam Neeson um, new movie on Netflix that just, I think it came out just this week or the, in the last week. Um, and it's something like Truths or something like that. I don't know if anybody else can remember what the name of it was, um, but it was a very, I, won't, I don't want to ruin the movie, but it was a very, very fascinating movie. And it, it took quite a while for you to figure out what the truth behind his character and his life and all these things were. And they did a pretty good job. At, you know, it was probably at least three quarters of the way through the movie before I figured anything out, you know, and, and I love that in the story and that, that, you know, what you thought was real, what he thought was real turned out not to be real. And, um, and stuff like that. So, you know, th those kinds of areas for me are very exciting. Spy novels and things that, you know, where you, you know, double agents and stuff like that are, are a great part of storytelling because, again, we can play with truths and lies. We can play with things that are deceptive if we're, if we're very smart and crafty about this, right? Um, and, and allow these kinds of things to happen where we begin to question ourselves, begin to question what people are saying to us and things like that. And if it's done well, it can make for a really compelling experience. So Jonathan, um, do you think it's easier to work with an existing IP or creating a whole new IP? So tough question. You know, I, I have done a lot of both. Um, I think the, the advantage of working with a existing IP um, from a storytelling perspective, it, you know, is that a lot is already established. I don't have to start off with making, you know, who is Luke Skywalker? Who is Darth Vader? Who is Boba Fett? Right? Those things are kind of established. And so I can jump into the storytelling quite a bit faster and easier. There's a lot less to define. But depending on the kind of game you're working on, the kind of IP it is, you know, and all the stuff which you've heard me talk about before, the, re the restrictions of that IP, what they allow you to do or not allow you to do and everything else can be very detrimental. Um, and so, again, it can help kickstart you and make, and make you work faster, but it also can limit you sometimes, right? And then the IP itself can even change, you know, and have problems. Um, I was working on a Boba Fett game. Um, this was before Star Wars Episode One came out. So Star Wars Episodes Four, Five, and Six came out, and if you remember, there was a, a pretty big time gap until Episodes One, Two, and Three came out. And I was working on a Boba Fett game in between those two um, movies, and we were pretty far along into the game, you know. And um, suddenly, you know, Lucas licensing was calling me with a lot of Boba Fett questions. There was there was a lot of just like weird stuff kind of going on that we were trying to figure out what happened because we had designed this whole game around Boba Fett and I had literally studied everything about Boba Fett and knew everything in the extended universe about Boba Fett from every book, comic, game, 
movie, everything, right? And I had sorted it all out and kind of created a compendium to know like what was really true about Boba Fett because he was a little mysterious if you look at the extended universe. And um, and then suddenly our game got canceled. And I was like, what happened? And, um, and that all came about because George decided to introduce Jenga Fett. And Jenga Fett was not part of the original universe and or storylines. And that whole structure, which don't get me started on, um, irked me badly, um, changed, you know, Boba Fett significantly and ultimately canceled our project. But, it, you know, in my mind, messed up the universe. So, so there's a, an example of like, where sometimes even working in the universe can be a little scary, a little risky and, and frustrating because even the universe itself can change, you know, and, and mess with you. Right. So, so there's, there's goods and bads to both. Um, and you just have to be kind of careful of, of navigating the minefields and making sure that you can, you can create, you know, a great story and a great game out of what they give you and, and, or are you allowed to expand their universe and create something new within the confines of their universe? And will that be approved? Um, and that's something that you really need to, to look at and understand um, and, and stuff. Because, again, both both techniques, whether you make your own or, or work with an existing one, have pluses and minuses. And, again, it just depends on the IP. And I've had some amazing IPs like Star Wars I've worked on. And I've had other IPs that just I wanted to pull my hair out and shoot myself because I was so frustrated with the limitations of the IPs and everything that was in it. But sometimes we just get stuck in those worlds, right? And that's, we're, we're professionals and we do our jobs. And, and, and so we, we sometimes just have to say like, you know, here's Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, and what can I do with that? Not a whole lot, but you know, I worked with it, you know, and you just kind of do your best. And, and so it's just kind of, you know, there, there's definitely times where we don't, as game designers like to work on what we're working on because it's a license. And I would have much rather have been doing my own original IP, but I also like the fact that licenses can be a great experience and allow me to make and focus on the game versus just on the story. So hi, Audrey. Thanks for joining us. Um, so let's see here. So stories ultimately, you know, are a lot of details, right? And, and it's important that you kind of sort out we'll call them categories, right? And when you start making a game, when you start writing a story, it's really important to kind of understand the the, the categories of, of where the different stories are taking place and kind of like what's, you know, what's important, what's not important, you know, what's required, what's just kind of helpful. Um, you know, required might be a quest that you have to take um, versus helpful might be like that example of overhearing two guards talking and then giving me a hint. Um, filler would be something that maybe like in some RPGs, there could be a historical book that you, you can read literally in words. And, you know, some RPGs have had literally tens of thousands of pages of written story that just make their universe big. And, you know, there's probably three people in the world that read those, but they exist. Right. And some game designer felt it was worth, you know, writing all that out for some reason. Um, so, so stories and stuff can exist for purely emotional reasons. They can exist for, you know, all sorts of stuff to, to guide you through the game, just to make it interesting or whatever it is. But I encourage you to categorize your stories and understand what's really important. Because if you don't, it's very easy to go down a lot of the proverbial um, rabbit holes where you'll just start chasing stories that have absolutely like no, you know, um, um, we call it relevance to what, your, to what the game itself really is, right? And it doesn't mean that it's not fun or interesting for the universe, but don't go spend weeks and months and years designing a bunch of side stories that the player may not ever see or may not ever get to and things. And so prioritize yourself on this. I want to temper your your storytelling things. You know, again, do not ever go in and just try to, to design an entire, you know, game story all by yourself, like and write it all at once without understanding what the gameplay is first. What is the game? What's the game experience? You design these together, right? So stories and gameplays need to all be designed together. So today we are talking about story, but I'm really trying to, again, talk about form and function, right? That story provides function just as much as it provides the form, right? So story makes the world more rich. Story makes the world more interesting and, and stuff like that. But story also, you know, can be a, a really deep, deadly, 
you know, hole that you go down um, that can can suck away a lot of time and waste a lot of time, you know, and be something that, that you get too focused on, right? So know how much story you really need for everything. Because again, this is this is probably one of the biggest areas of of waste or potential waste um, that you can go down as a game designer, right? And so just be really, really, really careful when you are designing and writing a story, you know, and whether you write it by yourself or writing it with your team and all the thousand aspects of the stories in the games and all these things, you know, know what to design and when, what to write and when, and how to design it and when um, is really important, right? And it doesn't mean that maybe all that doesn't get done by the end of the game, but don't like front load it and be like, hey, I'm going to go work for three months and just write this story. And then after that, I'm going to go design the game, you know, once the story's written. Um, that's kind of akin to Jonathan asking about working with a licensed IP. So the same problem can exist. Whether I go license a book, a novel, you know, a movie, TV series, or anything else, that, you know, if I go license a big, huge story that was never written for a game, like I've got a lot to work with, and that can be great, and it saves me a lot of time. Um, and in some cases, you know, the, the, the authors of those books, especially some big, you know, sci-fi novels and fantasy novels and stuff, those guys might have spent years and years and years and years writing those things. We'll, we'll never have that much time as artists and writers to, to, to create our universes, right? We're like, we got like six hours, you know, go, you know, and, and we do the best we can in the time we got, but we're always time crunched. Um, but in the same hand, um, when we have this existing story, we have this existing universe, um, whether we wrote it from scratch or whether it was licensed, we can get into the exact same jam, you know, and problem. And then suddenly like there's this great story and you read it by itself. You experience it by itself. You're like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then you go make a game and you're like, oh my God, what do I do with this? Cause it doesn't work, right? You know, it's not compelling as a game. doesn't work as a game. doesn't have enough mechanics as a game. There's not enough vehicles or units or forces or weapons or technologies or magic or whatever it is. And the story didn't understand that we needed these things to make some kind of game that was compelling. And then ultimately, you know, we ran into a lot of trouble, you know, trying to shoehorn this thing into something, right? And it just, you know, now we end up having to rewrite the story and, and expand it and fix it. And, you know, it can cost us a lot of time. So so please don't go off too deep, you know, when you're, when you're writing your stories and really understand this is a really, really, really hard problem. And just be aware, try to be self-aware of how much time you spend um, writing your stories and how much time you spend, you know, designing the games and, and, and vice versa, right? And just understand, again, this is where focus on what information is really required, what's really needed and what does the team need right now, um, you know, um, you know, what does the team need to design? Like, for example, characters. Like, you know, if the, if, the, if the character team is getting ready to start modeling a bunch of characters or doing the concept art for a bunch of characters, you know, and if it's up to you to d define what those characters are because you need to know what the gameplay is, then make sure you design those things like day one or, or week one or whatever that is so that the concept team can go do its job. Don't be like, hey, dude, I'll get back to you in six months. Like that doesn't work. You know, your client as a game designer and as a writer, as a storyteller is to provide the information to your team, um, you know, when they need it. Right. And so that's something to be aware of. You have to balance that, you know, and so that's something that you really want to, to try to understand um, how to find that balance of providing the team, the information it needs at high levels you know, and then eventually you can get in and write the, say the story of that character. But do I need to know every little detail about that character day one? Probably not, but I might need to know like his name and know like, is he a big dude? Is he got armor? Like, is he aggressive? You know, does he have a big gun? You know, like what is he, what is he, right? How does he function? You know, and what race is he? And you know, things like that, that like a, a concept artist would need to know. But that could be like a half page or a or quarter page or maybe one page at most, right? It doesn't need to be a five page detailed, you know, biography about this character. But maybe by the time the game ships, you might um, 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 have that, um, you know, or have that need, right? And, and be able to write that, you know, for yourself. All right. So ways to tell stories. So this is arguably one of the most important slides today. 
And we're gonna spend a little bit of time, you know, trying to give you guys some some examples here. Um, but I want you guys to to kind of listen on this slide because again, stories are a lot more than words. And um, and so stories, you know, are are a lot more than just you know the 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 text that we read or the voiceover that we might hear in a, in a more AAA game um, and and things like that. And I think there's a lot of people that just assume that when we talk about stories, that we go hire a writer and some writer writes some dialogue and some characters talk to each other, and that's the story in the game. So that's not really true. I mean, it, it can be. I mean, that that's a big part of it, or it could be. Um, but you know, but words are everywhere, right? You know, if we have a modern day game, um, you know, we might have characters that we directly talk to. We might have NPCs that are talking to each other that we can overhear. You know, we might have a bullhorn speaker, loudspeaker, you know, radios, whatever going on that we might be hearing, you know, a car drive by and there's, you know, a, a radio channel, like a talk show going on, talking about the, these weird creatures that are appearing, you know, over Europe right now and nobody knows what's going on. And we just get this, this glimpse as this car drives by us and we hear just this little bit of like, something and people are freaking out you know and then you know and then in the distance we even hear people scream and we're like it looks fine around here like it's okay right like you know and then we hear an explosion and we see a little poof <coughs> you know smoke over in the in the distance right that's all storytelling you know this is this is building a story it doesn't have to be uh, you know about just two people talking right yes you might have foreshadowed that you know even earlier you know and, and walked by a store and Two old guys are talking about, you know, how England and Russia are, you know, about to get into a war with each other or something bad is happening. They, they foreshadow and allude, you know, that something's going on, um, talking about Chinese hackers or whatever it is. And, you know, and then, it, you know, and something happens. And so we're, we're building these things up. We're building the logic and the reason for our stories. Um but those stories and those messages can be coming from so many different sources, right? I can be walking down the, the, the street, you know, and be seeing like a TV, you know, and there could be a TV playing in the department store window, you know, and that TV could have a news channel on it. And that news channel could, could be showing like some war breakout somewhere. It could be showing a bunch of dead bodies, you know, it could be showing, you know, an alien ship coming in, right? So do I look up in the sky and see the aliens or do I look over on some TV and I see some news report, right? How much do you want to show? You know, so there's an old adage of show, don't tell, right? And, and, and so when you're telling stories, really, I should, you know, should rename this to say show the story, right? You want to show what your story is more than you want to tell it, right? And, and so I want you to, to understand that there, there's so many little things and nuances and whether that thing is, is current um, or whether that thing is ancient, you know, I could be walking through the same town and be seeing some old TV that still somehow has power, you know, or an old radio that's broadcasting a signal still. And, you know, that thing, maybe it's been on loop for the last 50 years, you know, and, it, and the whole town's deserted and the zombie apocalypse has happened, but somehow this thing was on a generator and still running, right? It was on some solar powered generator and it gave me some information while I walked through it, but it was 50 years old. But maybe it answered a question. Maybe I didn't know how this um, um, thing started. Maybe I didn't know how the zombie apocalypse happened or whatever, you know, and this one thing could give me a clue or give me a hint, or maybe the radio is broadcasting a signal. This is a common trope of, of a lot of games where the, you know, that, that signal could be um, um, like, uh, what do you call it? Like a rescue thing where somebody's saying, hey, we're, we're over here, we're in Marysville. You know, and we're still alive and we're, you know, uh, and that kind of thing, right? And so now the player might have, you know, something where he goes, oh, wow, I know where that is. Like, maybe I should go there and see if they're still there, right? And we've seen that in The Walking Dead and, you know, in various shows. And so, so again, this the stories, the information can tell you a lot about the world. You know, especially if it's a strange new world or an alien world or something we're not familiar with. You know, it can it can tell us a lot about the world that used to be just as much as the world that it is, right? And so, so keep that in mind that there, there's a lot of things there um, about ways to tell a story. Um, but what's most important for me today is to really talk about how visuals and, and I.e. art 
tell stories, right? And I think this is where people don't understand the power of it, you know, where the picture's worth a thousand words, as they say, right? So how do you tell story through art? Every way, you know, how is somebody dressed, right? What is, what is the state of their clothing? You know, is it brand new? Is it old and full of holes? You know, do they have a, a big hole in it that's bleeding where they've, you know, been bitten or shot? You know, um, you know, do they have guns with them and weapons? And, you know, are they dressed, you know, aggressively like they're, like they're bad guys? Are they dressed like military? Are they dressed like some kind of a cliche, you know, stereotype um, of, a, of a role that, you know, we may know or think that they're doctors or, or policemen or firemen or soldiers? Um, that tells a story, right? Um, you know, so these things, you know, and how somebody's dressed, how the world is, is, is looking, um, without you even having a single word of dialogue, without you having to read a single world word of text, you can tell a lot by a world just by what's around it. If I'm walking through a forest and that forest is, is, is lots of big trees and, and everything's clean and everything's nice and, you know, and stuff. And it just feels like it's this beautiful, magical land and, and stuff that gives me one impression. Right. And that might be the world, you know, the way the world is now. However, like imagine now I come across a battle scene, you know, and, and this glade opens up and this grass field is there, you know, and, and now, you know, maybe I see uh, an old tank, you know, that I don't even recognize. Maybe it's alien. Maybe it's something that's just, you know, it, it could look hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of years old, you know, and it's half buried in things. And, you know, and then I look around and I see four or five or ten more of those, right, in various states of, of half destroyed, half buried, whatever. And I suddenly realize some big, massive battle happened there, right? So suddenly this peaceful planet, this, this, this serene, you know, thing that I was so like happy and comfortable in a minute ago, um, suddenly this, this thing shifts and it changes for me because suddenly I realized something terrible happened here. Right. And so that, that story, I didn't say a word, but I shifted the mood potentially or, or I created some interest. I'm like, Ooh, what's there. Right. So now my Indiana Jones hat comes on and I'm like, Hey, let's go dig through this stuff and let me go see what I can find. And maybe there's a weapon or something valuable or something like that. Right. I mean, you, you can elicit both in the way and how we treat it. Right. Um, but again, th th that was all just done through some art. Right. That was not done through me as a game designer putting up a line of dialogue that says 10,000 years ago, a, a bad battle happened here and lots of people died. You know, it, like, right. I didn't have to say that. I showed it. Right. Um, similarly, you could fast forward. Maybe I walk into that same glade and there's a bunch of smoldering tanks, you know, maybe they're, they're modern day, you know, T-72s or whatever it is, you know, and there's, there's soldiers that are, you know, literally still dying, you know, they're still on fire. There's still the remnants, you know, of what's going on there, you know, and it's obvious that this battle happened minutes ago, not, you know, days or weeks or months ago. And there's people still crawling on the ground and these horrific things are, are very fresh to me, right? So suddenly now that also completely changes my feelings, my emotions, how I'm looking at the scene. I, again, did not say a word. But suddenly I'm like, oh no, like something bad just happened here and I am here and now, you know, um, something bad might happen to me. Like, am I in trouble? You know, and, and then, and then I have also have to analyze, is this, is this a group or an entity that is a friend or an enemy or neutral? You know, and, and what am I supposed to do? Like, do I help them? Do I, you know, but if I go help them, is somebody going to kill me because I'm helping them? Um, how does that work? Right. And, and so, so again, without anything, suddenly a, a lot of story, a lot of emotion, a lot of things could just happen, you know, all because an artist took the time to, to put in a little Easter egg or put in a little something or, or the game designers, you know, had this, this whole concept again of, of putting something in there. Right. And, and then you can create even stronger emotions and more and more layers of this, you know, while you're walking by a guy and then he's, help me help me, you know, and, and stuff. And then maybe even, you know, as you walk up, you know, he asks you to kill him, you know, and please kill me. You know, I, I hurt so bad, you know, kind of thing. And now the player is like, do I shoot this guy or, you know, and put him out of his misery or do I help him somehow? Or do I just walk by him and you know, whatever? And, and, and so there, there's lots of these emotional moments that we can create in our stories, right. And, and can create these very compelling, you know, experiences. 
And then um, through all this is really about, you know, atmosphere, you know, and how do we create something that's very, you know, atmospheric in the sense that, again, you know, if I just walk out to a nice, bright, you know, field and the deer are bouncing around and Bambi's, you know, out there eating and, you know, and everybody's happy and content, that's, you know, one thing, right? But if, you know, if I go out there and there's a thick layer of smoke and there's fog and there's fire, you know, and then, you know, and you're like, what happened here? You know, you don't even know, like, who destroyed all these tanks. And then suddenly some big massive dragon, whoosh, you know, swoops in across the field and, you know, and fire just rains down right in front of you and just destroys, you know, even what was left of that that thing. And, you know, and that, that oh my God moment, you know, of fear is going to erupt inside of you, right? Um, and again, not a word of, of story was told, but you're telling the story through these actions, right? So Anna, how do you say your concept artist, which overall style the concept should have um, when the game is in early stages and the characters don't have special characteristics? Thank you, Anna. Um, nice for you to be here as well. Um, so, you know, I think when you're, when you're first starting a game project to reiterate you need to be working with um you need to be working with your designers usually so again each team's a little different so some teams the the concept artists may be just given a list of things to kind of go concept and they may say you know go do some aliens and go do this and do that you know and and if they trust the art team they may just give them a little bit of direction and tell them to go um Go off and do that, right? And so, so then it's up to the art team to work together to create a bunch of ideas, you know, create together some kind of an art book, you know, and, and, and a bunch of concepts and, and try to figure out what they want to create. Um, or it could be something where, um, the, um, you know, again, the, the creative director or somebody like that could be coming in and telling you, more what he wants and he may be specifying the, the function, the gameplay and the mechanics of that, you know, of that mechanic. And so, you know, this is where it becomes a team effort, you know, and you really can't, you can't just go off and be a wild card and go do what you want to do. You really need to understand what the hierarchy of the team is and what the rules, you know, of the team are, you know, and figure out. And then if you don't know, for example, like, how big the dragon is supposed to be or, you know, what are the features of the dragon? Like, does he breathe fire or things like that? Then those are the kinds of things you need to go ask, right? You need to have, you know, talk to people and try to get some specifications for what you're working on or what the characters need to have. Or, you know, does this character, you know, big and strong and slow moving? Is this character small, lightweight, nimble, um, and, you know, can run super fast like the Flash? You know, does this character fly? You know, so at some point, you know, you will need to work with a, a, a game designer um, in the perfect world to really create something that's very compelling. But I've also seen ideas where my concept artists have come to me and, you know, and I had some ideas, you know, and they came to me and said, well, hey, we've got some ideas for some characters. And I looked at them like, wow, okay, that's great. Like, I hadn't even thought about that. Like, I didn't think about putting wings on a character and, and a jetpack and, you know, some rockets and 10 arms. And wow, that was really cool. Like, can we do that? Like, oh, okay, cool. Like, let's put that in the game, right? Um, so it can go both ways. Um, but again, you have to get to know your team. And if you just go off and, and create a lot of ideas without, you know, on your own, you may get rejected very heavily and stuff. And so again, communication's everything within a team. And remember that games are a team project, right? And you need to be able to work with your team to figure out what is the right things to put into the game. So hopefully that answered your question correctly. And keep in mind also, you know, we're talking about kind of base art. I've talked about a little bit, but again, animation especially is incredibly important, right? We, we as human beings understand animation, especially in characters, a lot more. Um, you know, whether it's facial animations, whether it's, you know, body postures, you know, even just, you know, body language or, you know, things and stuff like that. We, we read and understand that stuff naturally, Um and so, so don't discount that, that stories and things like that, you know, can be often told through body language and, and animation and things like that in very compelling ways, again, with or without words, um, you know, and stuff, right? And so, um, so, you know, you could be, 
you know, across the street and see some guy slap a woman or something like that, right? And you'll know like something really, like obviously somebody's very angry, something very bad's happening. The guy just did something horribly wrong, really, you know, and and stuff. And then you have to know like, okay, am I supposed to go help her? Or like, what's what's going on here, right? Um, so it's that kind of stuff where even, again, not seeing a word, but just knowing and seeing an action um, could be something that's um, that can be very, you know, important and, and compelling, you know, for um, for you to understand. Now, real quick, switching subjects here just slightly. Um, I also want you guys to um, understand this really quick. Um, this is the the Bartel. Um, so Bartel, B A R T A T E L, um, player types. And Richard Bartel created these player types um, in relation to, you know, especially like MMORPGs, um, but it really is kind of true for a lot of different types of games. And regardless of, of what you're building, you need to understand that your game is going to have different types of players. And some of your players are going to be players who want story. Some of them don't want story. Some of them want to create their own stories. Some of them are going to bypass your cutscenes, and you know, as soon as they can skip it, they're going to skip it. So you you may spend millions of dollars on a game, right? Writing all these amazing cutscenes and animating them and doing everything else. You got to know that like half your players probably won't even watch those, right? Um, and then they're going to be confused when they go to try to like do some mission or some quest, and you know, and you had an important hint or or thing to do that was in some cutscene that they skipped. You know, and now they're confused and they don't know how to, to, to solve it, right? And so, so it's really important that you understand the player types and understanding that, you know, these the socializers are people who want to, you know, go in and talk to other players, and especially in multiplayer, you know, online MMOs and things like that. They, they get off on interacting with other players. And so their stories are quite often not only just the, their player character stories, their stories also come as group stories. Their stories might be my guild, my group, you know, my team went off and did this. My team went off and beat the enemy. My team went off and killed the dragon, right? So their stories might even be a slightly different story. It's a form of a player story, right? Um, but but understand that the player stories could even be, you know, um, a group-based story, you know, um, concept, right? So they, they, this does not have to be limited to a single player experience. Um I understand that some players are explorers and explorers are typically the types that really like stories and they want to find little secrets. They want to find little things. They want to find hints, you know, and, and, and uncover little secrets and things like that. They want to interact with the world. And so the world story for them becomes really compelling. And that's something that's important. Now, the killers are generally the types that, that don't care anything about story. Um, they just want to go off and fight, but they create their own player stories again, right? They went and killed all these things. They went and slew, slew the dragon, you know, that kind of thing. And so they're they're more interested in that type of a, of a story experience. And then the achiever is the person who's who's getting through the world and doing great things. They're they're you know um, completing the game and, and playing through it. And that's that's um, so getting through you know and, and scoring high and doing things like that is important to them. But quite often the stories. And the you know and the compellingness of that you know can be um, can be important to them. So so you have to kind of again understand those different types of players, right? All right. So now um, let's go back to some basics. Um, I want to talk a little bit about different story structures. Now again, I I expect that half of you have probably already seen this in school, um, but I want to to kind of reinforce how critical this is to understand as a game designer. You may have forgotten this. You may have only had brief exposure to it, um, but you really need to understand these concepts very clearly um, if you're going to write, you know, especially the overall story arcs or sub subplots and things like that. So let's, let's go back to school a little bit. Let's learn some basics. We're going to kind of um, go through a bunch of things to understand, you know, um, how a story is structured. All right. So the three act story structure is kind of the most common story structure out there. Um, and really, it's that we talked about earlier. It's the beginning, the middle, and the end, right? And um, and really, almost all or all stories really have the same structure. Now, we'll talk a bit about a nine-act story structure that's a slightly different variant, but it really is just an elaborate three-act story structure for all intents and purposes. Now, typically, in most of your stories, you, you can see how in... Um, 
In this one, there, there is a single line up that the, the story builds and builds and builds and builds and builds until the, this, you know, three quarters of the way or so through the movie um, or the game or the experience, you kind of hit the climax, you know, and you hit this peak over here. And then in that point, that's kind of usually where maybe the bad guy dies or something, you know, there is happening in that final little bit of a story is kind of the resolution and, and stuff. And that's where it kind of comes back down again. And so what this is showing is you can start at the beginning and you've got, you know, these different problems that keep existing. And there's some climax in act one, something that happens, like maybe a sub boss happens or your, you know, your friend gets killed. There's something bad or, or really compelling that generally happens in between act one and act two, because this is kind of the setup. This is the, this is where things are beginning. And now generally this sets up the confrontation of like, we know who the bad guy is now. We figured that out. And now through act two, we're basically going after him, right? We're trying to stop him. Um, and now whether that is a, a linear line and it's, and it's there or whether it's really can be a series of arcs and, and stuff is about the pacing and what you want to create. But, you know, usually it's a bit more like this kind of a line that you're building, you know, and that you want, again, the intensity to, to keep ratcheting up, keep getting more and more intense, harder and harder and harder, you know, that kind of thing, right? So, so keep in mind that this three-act story structure and this pacing of your story is showing that, that the pacing of your story is never flat, right? Your pacing is never just this, this flat, monotone, pointless, you know, thing. You always want ups and downs in your story and, and the intensity and what's happening, you know, and how, again, whether the emotions, there's, there's lots, this, this relates to lots of different things of, of how you're, you're writing your stories. Now, the nine act story structure, I won't get into, um, um, I believe, you know, this was originated by a, a man named David Siegel. Um, and um, there's there's been a, a couple others, Richard Vogler as well, um, you know, who also uses this. Um, and they, they have built a lot of different versions of this, but it's basically the same exact type of structure from a three act, but they've made it a little bit more um, formulaic and, and probably a little bit more useful. Um, and again, Formulas in game design are not bad. So don't feel weird that you have to reinvent the wheel. Like every, you know, almost every movie out there uses a three act or a nine act story structure. Almost every book uses a three act or a nine act story structure. You know, don't feel like, oh, I'm new and unique and I want to do something different. So I'm going to do five acts, right? Um, so, you know, you need to understand like what what is important for your story and don't feel like you need to reinvent these wheels um, these wheels exist and, you know, and these things exist because they're compelling and they're useful. So don't feel bad about, about using them, right. And, and, and reusing them. Now, um, I'm not going to get into super depth about this today. Um, I have talked about, um, Joseph Campbell's, um, mythology and, and the different stages a little bit in my past, um, stuff and, and we may have to do an entire class just on, on this one topic alone. Um, but if you've never heard of Joseph Campbell, um, I highly recommend you read his books, um, like The Hero of a Thousand Faces, things like that. Also, if you go into YouTube and you type in Joseph Campbell, um, he passed away some years ago. Um, but he, um, there was a lot of interviews with him. He did some very compelling stuff. And his, his stuff is this intersection of mythology, storytelling, and religion. And, and he shows how they all kind of interrelate. And what he's basically done is taking kind of the equivalent of a, of a three-act or a nine-act story structure, and he broke it into 17 steps. And these 17 steps, um, there's, there's entire books about this, if you don't believe me, to, to go read. Um, but he can show you that 95% of all the stories, not just movies in human history, but stories throughout the history of mankind, all follow this pattern. And if you really understand it, if you really, some of it's very literally, like Star Wars follows this exactly. Um, but, you know, other movies, it's not quite so, you know, um, exacting. But when you really study it and you understand it, you're like, oh, wait, yeah, they, they really do follow this very closely. And so, so what this is, is, you know, starting off the, 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 the hero, you know, in kind of his normal everyday world, right? And, and he gets this, um, what they call this call to adventure. And that's the like, like Luke Skywalker gets the call to adventure when R2-D2 and C-3PO show up, you know, and he gets the message from Princess Leia. Um, but 
he doesn't really believe it. And he doesn't, you know, he still is stuck on what he wants to do. And so he has this refusal of the call, right? And then, you know, and then R2 runs off. And, and so he gets the supernatural aid. And this is Obi-Wan Kenobi. When Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, um, um, shows up, you know, and, and shows him, you know, and teaches him kind of, you know, about the force. Um, and then, you know, he gets into the, um, like the crossing the first threshold, I believe, if I remember right, was when he meets um, Harrison Ford, you know, and, and you know, in the cantina. And, um, you know, in that, um, I can't remember, he was in one of these two steps. I can't remember if this was Obi-Wan or that was there. Anyways, forgive me, I forgot the exact order now. But, and then gets into the belly of the whale. The belly of the whale was when they get sucked into the Death Star. You know, and that's their equivalent of kind of, you know, getting sucked into this thing they can't get out of. Then they have to do these things to get out of the Death Star. Um, and then, you know, um, and you're meeting with the goddesses, meeting, you know, and learning about love and stuff and having these temptations. You know, atonement with the father, Luke and, and Darth Vader, you know, having, you know, atonement there. Um, you know, um, this is when um, Obi-Wan Kenobi dies, apostasis, you know. This is a, a little bit more complicated version of it, but to, to, to go through this whole thing, you know, in the end, he, he comes back around. They, they often call it um, bringing the elixir um, back. And so in the case of Luke, um, his elixir was the death, was the, the, the plans to the Death Star, bringing those back to Princess Leia um, and, and Alderaan and allowing them to destroy the Death Star. That, that elixir that he brings back is really what saves the, 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 the story, saves the world, saves the planet. And, um, and then ultimately, then he he's um, you know becomes the the savior, and, you know, and that changes his whole life. And so, so this whole thing is is really about this separation from who he is, the initiation of what he's becoming, and then the return. So again, kind of three acts, right? So um, if you're unfamiliar with this, if you've never heard about this before, I definitely encourage you to go out and, and seek out you know more about. Um, Joseph Campbell and, and his mythology stuff. It's super, super, super useful for game designers and storytellers and everything. And so, um, um, you know, definitely check it out. And this was just a, I won't go through this right now, but this is one that um, Richard, or Christopher Vogler um, also wrote up, kind of showing again how in these three act story structures, how all these things line up. And again, if you think about systemic game design, if you if you watch my classes on systemic game design and understand systemic game design, while the, why this really helps you is you start to understand like, oh, I'm at this part of my story. I'm at this part of my level. I'm in this part of my world. So I need to do this right now. I need to go meet this guy. I need to go defeat this enemy. I need to go do and overcome this thing. And so all these points start to help you because you start to realize like, oh, I kind of need to do something like this around here. And so the systemic side of it will help you solve a lot of problems. You'll know where the where the hero needs to go a little bit. You need to you kind of have this this map drawn out in front of you. If you really understand what this is, this can really help save you because it's not just a blank canvas that you're looking at, but you're actually looking at this piece of paper and going like, "Oh, I got a bunch of stuff I know that's kind of there. Now, how do I fit that into my story? How do I fit my game into this?" you know, three act story structure and this hero's journey and these things. And trust me, it makes your level design and your storytelling a thousand times easier. Um, by the way, everybody, um, we got five more minutes. Um, if anybody has any questions, please, please, please ask right now. Um, so I can make sure and, and you know, and answer them for you in, the, in these last few minutes. Otherwise I'm going to, I'm going to crash through, um, some slides here and, um, Thanks everybody again for, for coming today and spending your precious time with me. I really appreciate it. And I hope this is helping you. Um, we did only get about a third of the way through my slides today. So it looks like we'll probably continue this conversation next week. Um, you know, and continue to talk about storytelling, you know, in games. So, um, but let me try to show a few more slides and get through just kind of this three act story structure so you guys can understand it a little bit better. And then we can start next week on the new topics. So again, just more details and more stuff about understanding, you know, that there's different three act story structures and you understand that again, it's about pacing. You don't want a flat story. You don't want flat emotions. You want things that are going up and down. Um, you're welcome, Penny. Glad you liked it. Um, you don't want these stories to go up and down. You want things, you know, that are, that are, you know, exciting and scary and happy and fun and all these different things need to work into your story, right? And if you don't do that, 
um, um, then you know it, you lose interest, right? Anything that's just flat emotionally isn't going to be exciting, right? And so, so these these acts in your story structures and these pacings are there and they're designed to keep us interested, right? And if we're not doing that as game designers and if we're not doing that as creators and artists and storytellers, we're in big trouble. Um, but you have to remember that that changes need to happen, right? And and change is not only your main story plot. But one of the important things here to talk about is character arcs. So one of the things that's also important in most stories, and, and not every story has this, but the stronger and the best stories always have character arcs. And if you pick up David Freeman's book, he does talk a lot about this and how to create strong um, character arcs and emotions. But in short, a character arc means that most characters need to change over time. Most characters need to maybe start off as maybe a bad guy and they become a good guy as an extreme example. Or they start off scared, you know, in the beginning and then become, you know, brave or whatever that is. But, but they need to change over time. All characters that are interesting change over time. You know, a, a, a character that starts off, you know, as Rambo and ends as Rambo is not all that interesting, right? If Rambo is just Rambo and he, he literally is just the same exact character throughout and he's always a badass or whatever. Um, we don't, we don't humanize with them as much. We don't empathize with them as much and stuff. So, so if you're not familiar with character arcs and don't understand them, we'll, we'll try to get more into that later, but, but really look into character arcs and understand that strong characters need to change over time. And likewise, next week we'll get much more into subplots and things like that and story arcs, but, but keep in mind that there's an overall arc that we're going to talk about. And then there's lots of little small, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of little small story arcs that are going to happen throughout, you know, your entire game, right? And, um, every quest, every mission, objectives, all those things, each one of those is a little story arc, right? And, and those all have a very similar kind of path and route that your overall arc also has. But trying to fit those all together is what's really, um, Tricky, and so so you need to understand why you need to have a subplot, and that you know these things really help your your, your main plot. And you need to understand of, like how that how your story you know goes through through the game, you know, and and how this you know and how these different storylines are, are are working together to make it a lot more compelling. And ultimately, you're you're arcing all these different stories to start and stop at different points, just to kind of keep this the story more more interesting for yourself. And so. So again, your quests and your objectives and your subplots and everything else like that are, are what's going to drive all these, these sub stories, subplots and these different areas. And, and most games are going to want to have this, you know, unless your game's really, really simple, unless your story is really, really simple, you're going to want to have all these things, you know, in it. So that was where I planned to get to today. So I, I guess pretty right. Um, so next week, um, we'll have, we'll have another, um, di- deeper dive into this and we'll, we'll get more into different types of, of story structures, plot structures, quest structures, linear, nonlinear, you know, open world, you know, all these kinds of things. So you can really start to understand how to apply this into your game. So anyways, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, thanks everybody for, for being here. We'll see you Jonathan on Thursday and, um, hopefully we'll see everybody else next week. So have a safe week, everyone, and take care and be safe. Bye now. Thanks again.